Right. Leg injuries in horses play such an important part that they can literally destroy, literally destroy a trainer or owner. A horse which may be worth a million dollars one day can become a thousand dollar horse just overnight simply because he bowed a tendon or injured a suspensory ligament. <coughs> now, why do we have this situation? Primarily because the treatments which are now available are not really much good, as you'll see as we progress with this presentation. <coughs> a new approach has now been developed, which is far superior and which, ma which makes leg injuries easy to treat, and horses which have injured bow which have bow tendons or other leg injuries can be easily brought back to normal with this method. And I hope that if you clearly understand this method, that from now on you will no longer live in fear of leg injuries. Now the main reason why in the past we have had so little luck with leg injuries is primarily because people, very few people, clearly understood exactly what happens when a horse injures his, injures his leg and secondly what should be done to treat that horse. Now let us look at these rough diagrams here which demonstrate what happens during an injury. Now this is a rough schematic showing the structure of a tendon or ligament. You can see these bl black lines represent the fibers which run parallel to each other and hmm, there are a great number of them, literally thousands and millions and it has to be remembered, this is a very important point, that the fibers are not firmly attached to each other they are loosely bound with, by connective tissue which runs in, in between them. Now, this is an important point because if a fiber becomes injured, it is so loosely attached to the one next to, next to it, to the neighboring fiber, that it does not, this, the injury, the injured fiber does not really affect the other fibers or the neighboring fibers to any significant degree. Now this schematic shows what happens when some of the fibers which make up a tendon or ligament are torn. You can see that these three fibers have been torn. The ends have been dragged apart. There's a fairly wide gap between them. As you can see, the neighboring fibers are not affected by the damage to these fibers. However, the gap the tear is now beginning to fill up with blood, which is marked with these red dots here. Now the next stage, this, this would perhaps happen, this stage would be reached, let's say, several hours after the original injury. It is, should be remembered, and this is an important point, that the circulation in tendons and ligaments is very poor. Therefore, when a, a tendon tears when some of the fibers are torn, the gap does not immediately fill with blood. That occurs only some time later. Now if nothing is done and the process is allowed to proceed at its own pace, the next stage looks something like this. Here we have the same three fibers which are torn. Now the blood has filled the gap or the tear and the blood begins to seep in between the fibers as shown here, and also it begins to press on the walls, causing the tendon to assume a bowed appearance. The tendon is not really bowed, but it is pushed apart by the pressure of the blood here. Now that will then also affect the surrounding lymph and blood vessels, causing stagnation, stagnation of blood and lymph all around, and causing what we call a swelling and giving the, the tendon a con, a, an increasingly bowed appearance. Now, if this process, if nothing, nothing is done to halt this process, the tendon will bow increasingly, within reason, depending on the degree of injury, and you will a larger and larger portion, pr proportion of the tendon will be affected, and you will get increasing amounts of blood stagnating and lymph and other fluids 
stagnating around the injured part, which, will, which the degree of stagnation can occasionally become so great that the entire tendon will actually swell from top to bottom, or only part of the tendon may swell. And this, once again, gives the tendon a bowed appearance. That's why we say the horse has bowed a tendon. Now, <coughs> you, you get two very important things happening here. First of all, the blood itself may seep in through the tissues between the fibers, solidify, and cause so-called adhesions. If nothing, nothing is done to promote circulation, the, the swelling itself may also harden, become organized, and form more adhesions. And in fact, this is one of the most important things that you have to understand about tendons. The original damage may be very insignificant, but the damage caused by the hardening and organization of, and, of, and, and the production of of adhesions and by the swelling and by the poor circulation is far greater and far more important than the original injury. In fact, the, this damage caused by the poor circulation can be thousands of times more important than the original injury. The original injury seldom plays any part in causing the horse to re-injure, but if the swelling is allowed to organize and harden and adhesions are allowed to form, then <coughs> the horse will re-injure quite readily because the tendon will become stiff, inelastic, weak, and unable to withstand these stresses of galloping, racing, and other uh, competitive sports. Now that, you, now that you understand this, we will refer to these diagrams many times later on. Let us Look at this. This is a diagram showing a vein. Most people don't realize it, but veins have tiny valves inside them, which allow the blood to flow in only one direction, as shown by these arrows. Now, in other words, the blood can only bl flow towards the heart. It cannot flow away from the heart because the valves will prevent backflow. Now, every time the muscles, these drawings here represent muscles, contract, as shown on this drawing here, this rather rough schematic, every time that the muscles contract, they will compress the vein. And since the blood cannot go back down because its backflow is prevented by the valves, it can only move upwards. Therefore, the muscles play a very, very important part in stimulating circulation. Every time the muscles contract, they pump blood forcibly towards the heart again. So in other words, the heart pumps the blood away towards the extremities, and the muscles are responsible for pumping the blood back towards the heart. Now, here's the last of these schematics, and it demonstrates the situation which arises when extreme swelling takes place, if a vein becomes engorged with blood and extremely stretched and swollen, the valves become ineffective. They simply cannot reach across. And now the blood, instead of flowing in only one direction, will flow back and forth and begin to stagnate and harden. The blood, or swelling if you like, will then become organized and hardened and will, will, become, will form massive adhesions, which may make it impossible for the horse, for horses, lever, for, horses, for the horse's tendons and ligaments to ever become functional again, therefore making, it, making a resumption of racing or work out of, out of the question. So therefore, now you have to clearly understand what happens. The original injury is usually, in the majority of cases, of very little significance. The real damage is done not by the, is caused not by the original injury, but by the stagnation of blood due to poor circulation. Therefore, the first and most important thing that you have to do to get the horse back to normal is to use every possible means 
to stimulate circulation. That is the, if you can successfully do that, you will heal the horse so effectively that all signs of injury will very rapidly disappear and your horses will be, will be as, absolutely as good as new, often after as little as one month or maybe two months, even if the injury is quite severe. Now we have said that the, by far the most important thing is to keep the circulation going. On no account must the blood and the swelling be allowed to organize and become uh, solidified mm. and form adhesions. There are five ways basically in which you can stimulate the circulation. First of all, by doing what we are showing here, by placing the horse's leg in ice. Now to do this, I'm sure you have already done it about a thousand times or more, or ten thousand times, so you probably are not too interested in what I'm showing here, but nevertheless, I will go through the motions just in case there are listeners who have not, never iced the horse's leg. Anyhow, what you do is you put about, fill the bucket with water to about halfway up, and then put the horse's leg inside, as we've done here. Then you put a bag of ice in, and <coughs> keep the legs, the horse's leg inside, and do whatever you can to prevent the horse from lifting his leg and pulling it out. Now the assistant is uh, trying to keep the horse calm. Now, what effect does the ice have on the swelling? The ice has a powerful constrictive effect on the tissues. The tissues constrict, tighten up, and push the swelling out. Therefore, the ice plays an important part in preventing swelling, in maintaining normal circulation, and initially, the most important thing it does is it prevents the blood, which the, the bleeding. Therefore, if the uh, ice is applied soon enough after the injury, the bleeding can be reduced to such an extent that the <coughs> adhesions, which, you, which could be caused by the blood seeping in between the tissues, as we showed on that diagram, can be entirely prevented. The ice application is important in the first day or two, maybe three or four days, but after that it becomes less important. But initially, if possible, if you have the manpower and so on, and if you really care about the horse, you can ice the horse's leg as often as every hour on the hour, for say five minutes, or maybe a maximum of ten minutes. I don't think it is necessary usually to ice a horse's leg for longer than that. Now the second important way of trying to maintain normal circulation and prevent stagnation of the swelling and hardening of the swelling and formation of adhesions is bandaging the horse. A horse with an injured leg or injured tendon or ligament and so on should be kept in bandages absolutely all the time. They should never ever be taken off, either during rest in the stall or during exercise. Now, the next very important way of um, trying to prevent adhesions, prevent stagnation of the um, swelling, and trying to promote normal circulation is to lift the horse's leg up, as shown here, as I'm doing here, and gently Take the tendon or ligament between your fingers and gently massage, it, massage the swelling up towards the heart. This has two effects. First of all, it will move the swelling, prevent it from hardening, and secondly, almost as important, it will prevent the formation of adhesions. It will prevent the blood and the lymph and the swelling from hardening and becoming organized and gluing the tissues together. This should be done, or can be done, as often as once every hour. If you really care for your horse and you want, to be, want him to get well quickly for you, you can do this every hour, once, a, once an hour, gently, gently, not to irritate the horse. <coughs> and then, 
you can put in this picture, in this uh, picture I am putting on some polar wraps. I have found Canterbury polar wraps to be by far the most effective. They are the bulkiest, widest, and give the best support. And the horse is being prepared for exercise. The fourth and maybe most important, although I shouldn't say that because all these steps are very important and they cannot really overlap. They do not take each other's place. But the fourth and very, very important and perhaps once again most important way of stimulating the <coughs> circulation is to use a, an ele a small electrical muscle stimulator. Now, these are, this is the stimulator laid out you can see the little electrical muscle stimulator. These are the pads. These are the bandages which, are at, which hold it in place. Mm. There's the bottle with the contact lotion. That's the stimulator itself. Mm. And this is attached to the horse and stimulates movement of the muscles, as you'll see in a moment, and maintains normal circulation in a way which is quite impossible by any other means. If the stimulator is left on the horse long enough, it will prevent all blood stagnation, all swelling, and increase the rate of healing incredibly. If you really care about your horse and you want him to get well as fast as possible, you, will, you should keep the stimulator on the leg all the time. Now here you have, we are putting it on. Now in my hands I have a chamois which was soaked in water and by using the chamois I have damped or put lots of water on the horse's foreleg. Now you attach the chamois on first. The chamois gives the <coughs> whole thing a good grip so that the stimulator will not slip off the leg afterwards. Now you put a bandage over the chamois to quite tightly so as to prevent the chamois from slipping down. Only a chamois like this will give you the necessary traction. If you, would, if you don't use the chamois, the muscle stimulator will slip down the leg and you and, and you'll and you lose it. Now that the chamois is on, now I am putting the contact lotion onto the pads, onto the little electric pads. You can see the contact lotion there. Now the pads are placed on the muscles in front. There are a total of four pads. These are placed on the front muscles and held in place with another bandage. Now two more pads are put on the back muscles. The electrical stimulator has a total of four pads. <coughs> two are placed in, uh, uh, they are two pairs which function separately. The ones on the left switch on first and stimulate, stimulate the muscles in front on the front part of the leg and then they switch off to give these muscles a rest and the ones and the current is switched to the muscles on the back of the leg. The current itself is very insignificant. It's a very weak current. It does not take much to make a horse's muscles contract. The little stimulator has a tiny battery in it which lasts for a long time you get at least 60 hours out of that tiny battery. It, it takes a very, very small amount of current to make the muscles of a horse's leg contract. Now you see the stimulator is in place and I am switching it on. As you can see, and now you'll, you'll see the muscles begin to contract in a moment. There they go. Now if you remember the diagrams I showed you, every time the muscle contracts, 
it not only moves the leg to some slight degree, but it also, in this case at least, not very much, but most important of all, and that's what we are looking for, it stimulates the circulation. Therefore, as the muscles contract, the, body, the blood is pumped forcibly away from the injured area and up towards the heart, and all the swelling is removed. This creates a, an extremely favorable situation or conditions for healing because since the horse is not being exercised at all during the treatment and the tissues are not being fatigued in any way, therefore all the goodness in the blood, practically all the goodness is used not so much to restore the tissues after exercise, because there is no exercise, but all the goodness is used to heal the injured, injured part. You can see how it's contracting rhythmically, at least, I think, twice per second. And although you can't see that too well, every about 30 second it's seconds it switches from the front to back so that each group of muscles is given a rest. Now you see the muscles, it has stopped and the stimulation has switched to the back. You can't see that too well. But now the front has started to move again. So the muscles never fatigue. There is no such thing as the <laughs> horse getting tired in any way, whatever. Therefore, you can leave this apparatus on the horse's leg absolutely indefinitely. If you have a very valuable horse and you really want to get him well quickly, <coughs> you can actually leave it on his legs 24 hours, absolutely around the clock, 24 hours straight. Simply never take it off. It is necessary to take the uh, little machine off occasionally, however, because the pads, will, everything will dry up. And you, so every about three hours, you'll have to take the whole thing off and put it back on again and wet the pads afresh, put more contact lotion and so on. But uh, if you have an expensive horse and you really care about him and you want to get him well quickly, you can leave the uh, stimulator on his leg indefinitely. Uh, this will speed up recovery so much, so amazingly, that your horse will recover in a fraction of the time that it would normally take. Literally 10% uh, of the time. Now I'm going to lift the leg up to give you a better idea of the degree to which the leg is stimulated. Now you can see how much, now that the weight of the horse is no longer on the leg, preventing movement, you can see how much those muscles are moving. You can see them twitching the leg and you can imagine how much the circulation is stimulated tremendously. Uh, it's not a matter of increasing circulation 100%. It is likely that the circulation is increased by 1,000%. The, in other words, it's 10 times normal. Thanks. Now, the next thing that should be done to improve circulation is the horse's feet should be cut down. Initially, especially the first few days, the horse should be given no oats at all, only hay. In fact, even the hay ration should, can be restricted. Too much food leads to the blood becomes too rich, and that <coughs> significantly increases the likelihood of swelling. If you cut the horse's food down enough, his feet down, the swelling that will significantly reduce the amount of swelling. Uh, it is a good idea to place the horse, a horse on something he cannot eat. Instead of having him stand on straw, put him on wood shavings or uh, something, sand or whatever. You have something that he won't eat, won't gorge himself with. Now, the how long does this stage last? How long is it before we start actually exercising the horse? Obviously, the most important thing that the thing that's going to bring the horse back to normal is exercise. All these treatments that we have seen so far 
will stimulate circulation, prevent adhesions, prevent <coughs> stagnation of swelling, prevent hardening of swelling, prevent the formation of new adhesions, and carry, away, carry away the blood and bring the tendon back to normal and heal everything. But even so, they will not restore normal strength to the tendon, they will not restore normal elasticity to the tendon, they will do nothing to improve the circulation in those parts of the tendon which have become significantly damaged by the initial injury and possibly by the circulation problems in the early stages. The only thing that's going to bring back normal strength and normal elasticity and normal function is exercise. So how long, how long a period do we have before we start exercising? That of course depends on two things. First of all on the extent of the injury. If the injury is very severe, you will have to wait longer, obviously. Now secondly, on how hard you've been working. If you've been doing everything you can to bring things back to normal, then of course you can speed up the process tremendously and you won't have to wait so long before you start exercising. Now let's say that it just depends on the injury once more. The period may be anywhere between a few days and perhaps as long as one month. Therefore after a month we have to start exercising to bring the horse's leg back to normal so that all signs of injury disappear completely. So next we're going to talk about exercise uh, and hmm, about trotting on the lunge and trotting uphill and so on. When the horse's leg has fine down and pretty well returned to normal, now you need to start exercising. Now one of the one of the forms of exercise which can effectively be used is lunging, as you can see here. Now I am trying to demonstrate how not to do it right here. You can see that the lunge is hanging loosely. I have no contact with the horse. The horse is trotting slowly. Slow exercise like this does absolutely nothing for the leg. It does not stimulate the circulation sufficiently. It does not. <coughs> the horse is not exerting himself enough to strengthen the leg. It fatigues the tissues, which is a is an important point because as you fatigue the tissues because the circulation has not returned to completely normal yet, it is going to increase swelling. Therefore, slow trotting like this can actually be harmful and could, can do more damage than good. In a moment, you'll see, uh, here we go, go, we see now I have shortened the lunge. I've got a shorter grip on the lunge. I've got better contact with the horse. I've got my wh little whip out and I'm clacking at him to make him go. Only vigorous, fast trotting like this is of any value. Only vigorous, fast trotting like this will restore the horse's circulation to normal eventually. Only fast trotting like this will restore normal strength to the tendon and restore normal elasticity. In other words, normal function, making the horse absolutely sound, absolutely every bit as sound as he was before the injury ever occurred. <coughs> now this horse injured his legs very badly and had a tremendous bow tendon about six months before this video was taken and in a minute you'll see what his legs look like now. The, all the swelling has disappeared and the legs have returned to normal. Now how long would you have to trot like this? It is important to trot, keep the horse trotting on the lunge for at least 20 minutes, not once a day but twice a day. The reason for doing it twice a day is because if the horse is left in the stall for 24 hours between exercises, there's a danger of, the, of, of whatever swelling is still there becoming organized and hardening and forming adhesions and so on. Therefore, it is absolutely essential that the horse be taken out twice a day. Now you can see the horse is broken into a slow canter, which is not good, 
when he's canting, he's not really using himself. It is only when he's trotting quickly in an extended fashion, keenly, and really using himself, it is only then that he truly uses the leg and we get the results we are looking for. In other words, a, rest a restoration of normal elasticity, of normal strength to the leg, and of normal circulation to the leg. You can see that I am walking behind the horse. Mm. Whoever does the lunging should take the trouble to walk behind him, cluck at him, and chasing along, chase him along the wh with the whip, and, and at least try to make him trot as fast as he will go, really extend himself, mm. really make him go as fast as possible. Only that kind of exercise is of real value mm. and will restore the normal, normal function to the leg. Now this picture has been this picture has been taken to show you how incredibly this horse's legs have healed. If you consider that this horse had a huge bow only six months previously, it is incredible that every bit of the injury has disappeared. There is absolutely no bow. The tendons are perfectly firm. The horse is absolutely 100% sound, and the injury is has totally disappeared. The horse has actually run in a race since then with no re-injury. And <clears throat> you can see the tremendous advantage of this form of treatment and how well you can heal a horse's leg <coughs> by using this method. Mm. If, if he had been treated with any conventional treatment, he would have probably never raced again. And there would have been a permanent bow and uh, the horse would have been of no use for an awfully long time if he had ever held again. Like this, he is as good as new by far the most effective to, uh, exercise for restoring normal function and healing tendons is trotting uphill. In this picture, the rider is trying to show how not to do it. You can see that her reins are, re are hanging loosely. The horse is not collected. The horse is not made to trot out at all. He's trotting sluggishly and so on. This kind of exercise will do absolutely no good at all. In fact, it may cause the leg to swell more it will fatigue the tissues, the injured tissues. It does not bring normal blood, normal, normal circulation to the tissues and so on. The horse has to be made to trot briskly. Now this time the, trot, the rider is trying to make the horse trot the way he should be trotting. Really briskly, keenly stepping right out and really using himself. It is only this kind of exercise that stimulates the circulation sufficiently Mm. brings about improvement in circulation, brings about normal flexibility or restores normal flexibility, flexibility to the tendons and normal function and normal strength. It is essential to make the horse trot as fast as possible. If he does not want to do so by himself, then you just have to bring out another horse and make him trot next to the horse, next to him, so they trot next to each other. This will stimulate the horse to go, go more briskly and keenly. If you really care about your horse and the horse is really important to you, it is essential. The most important thing is to keep the, to really make him use himself and really make him trot out fast. Slow, sluggish exercise will not do the trick at all. Now we shall try to answer the ten most frequently asked questions. The ten questions that people ask me most frequently about this form of treatment. First of all, how about the prevention of leg trouble? How can I, what can I do to try and prevent leg trouble in my horses? Well, if a horse has already injured himself, or even if he hasn't injured himself, the, f the first and most important step that you can summarize in only a few words is too much, too soon. If you ask the horse to gallop too fast and so on before he's ready to do so, you increase the likelihood of injury tremendously. <coughs> In other words, before you put your horse into training, into hard training, you should give him a significant amount of preparatory work to strengthen the legs and get him hard and strong so that he, so that he can safely move into the next stage of galloping and working at racing pace, at, at racing speeds. Now, 
The second important factor, which is rather difficult to do anything about in this country, is what kind of tax do you have? It is a fact that in England and France, most of the tax, most of the training tax, run slightly uphill, and this makes it much easier to train horses. The horses do not have to be asked to go as fast as they do here. They do not have to go against the clock. Even a comparatively, comparatively slow pace, well below racing pace, is enough to get the horse very fit, almost fit enough to win first time out, and of course, when he's galloping uphill or working uphill, <coughs> then far less stress is and, and strain is put on the front legs, so the likelihood of injuries is, my, is very much reduced. In fact, I think statistics bear this out. The number of horses which in, injure themselves in England or France is far less than the, than the proportion of horses which have leg trouble in this country, where unfortunately most of the tracks, training tracks, are dead level, which is a big disadvantage. <laughs> now, in England, some trainers have begun to experiment with what is called the short interval training method, the short distance interval training method. This method involves galloping over only very short distances. Only very occasionally does the horse go any more, any further than about 600 yards. This method has proved to be vastly superior to the methods that were used so far, to the established methods, and the horse will, can easily be improved 5 to 10, ten lengths by using this method. It, and it reduces the likelihood of leg injuries to an absolute minimum because the horse is never put under any significant stress since he hardly ever goes more than whether galloping or canting or working or whatever he may be doing, he hardly ever goes more than 600 yards. So the likelihood of injuring the leg because of fatigue is literally minimal or, or non-existent. The next question that people ask is, what kind of results do you expect? What kind of results do you get? What percentage of horses do you fail on? Well, if you have understood what we have said so far, you can see that this question really doesn't make much sense. The person who asks a question like this can only ask it because they have not understood how this method works. It is fair to say that this method simply cannot fail. It will get every horse sound. No matter how badly the horse may be injured, he will always get 100% sound if you trot him and treat him long enough. There has to be a some kind of cutoff point, and mm, uh, some point where the whole treatment becomes uneconomical. If a horse has injured himself so badly that you have to treat him this way for a year or longer, well, <laughs> the result, in the end, you may get him sound, but by then you have spent so much money that you've, you cannot possibly recoup it, even if he wins races for you. However, it is impossible to tell by just looking at a horse how long he's going to take to get well. For instance, when I lived in England, we once bought a horse at a sale at a public auction for only a hundred pounds, which was Knacker's price. The only person who bid against us was the Knacker himself. <laughs> now, the real value of that horse must have been, at least by today's standards, at least half a million dollars or probably more. He had won several very good high-class stakes races and he was probably one of the best horses in England at the time. And yet we got him so cheaply because his legs looked absolutely awful. He had two huge bow tendons and uh, everybody thought that he would never ever return to racing. Yet when we tried this treatment on him, he improved rapidly and within two months his legs looked like new and he went on to race and win races and nev we never gave us any trouble at all. His f we, we raced him for two or three seasons and uh, had no further trouble with his legs at all. So you see, you cannot tell offhand how the horse's legs will, be will behave. The next question or question number three 
goes something like this. You say that ligaments are easier to treat than main tendons. How long would you say that it takes to get a horse with a suspensory ligament injury sound again? Now, there is no cut and dried answer to this question, simply because it depends on what you do and how much effort you put into trying to get the horse well. If you really go for it and keep that muscle stimulator on the horse's leg day and night and keep icing the leg every hour and keep massaging the leg and preventing stagnation, preventing adhesions and so on, a suspensory ligament is one of the easiest injuries to heal. As I will explain to you, I think best with an example, we had a horse called, Spe called Upslope mm. in 1961. And this was a six-year-old gelding which strained a suspensory in a five furlong work on about the 10th of June of 1961. Now, <coughs> the injury was not discovered until the following day. And the following day when I went into his stall, I found his leg was swollen, hot, very tender, and the horse was slightly lame. Now, <coughs> we immediately iced the horse's leg, and we iced it every hour on the hour. We immediately put the muscle stimulator on and massaged the leg as shown previously. And within three days, the horse's leg had pretty well returned to normal. There was very little swelling, but there was still some thickening, which could be felt especially well if you lifted the horse's leg and squeezed the suspensory between two fingers. You could feel the thickening, and there was still some tenderness if you squeezed then. At that stage, on the third or fourth day, we began trotting uphill. We trotted the horse uphill five times in the morning, and five times in the afternoon, really briskly, really tried to make him go, mm, the hill being about 80 to 100 yards long and fairly steep. After three weeks, the, legs, the leg had healed completely, and there was absolutely no sign of injury left whatsoever. Now, you can understand that we did everything. We stood on our heads to get this horse sound as fast as possible because he was a very good horse, a stakes winner, and we were hoping that he would win some more races for us. Now, within five weeks of the injury, the horse ran in a six furlong race. That was his first race after the injury. He finished last, well beaten. About two weeks or two and a half weeks later, he ran in a mile allowance race and finished second, beaten half a length. Eight days after that, he ran in a mile um, race which he won easily at odds on and only four days later he ran in a mile and five furlong marathon race as a twelve thousand dollar stakes race handicap stakes race of a mile and five furlongs which he won easily again and he won the second race only about nine weeks after he injured his suspensory so from this you can see that a suspensory injury can be cured very, very quickly if you really go for it and you really do everything that is necessary. Now here's the video showing Upslope winning the vet marathon. Close to the far turn for the final time. Upslope by a half. Three Ombres Gold is second by three quarters of a lane. Delectable is third by four lanes. Thirty Sam is fourth. And not to miss, has got some run, but still about six lanes out of it. As they turn for home for the final time, up slow by three quarters of a length to the middle of the racetrack. Electable is second, and running third is three hombres gold. Deep, deep stretch. Up slow, gonna win the marathon. Running second on the outside, electable third, three hombres gold. Now, that I think is absolutely incredible. I think you'll agree that a horse was uh, following only nine weeks after a severe suspensive injury. This horse ran not just once, but three or four times and won twice, and he went on the following months to win two more races, and all that thanks to this wonderful method of treating legs. I don't think any other method could have ever produced this kind of result. I mean, firing, blistering, or any of the other salves and ointments that are used mm, would never have got the horse sound with the speed that this worked. Now, next, I will show you a tape of a horse called Persuasive Prince winning at Bay Meadows
<coughs> persuasive prince uh, injured a tendon three years previously, and this was nothing sensational. The point I'm trying to make is that mm, if any other method had been used, the horse would have had a bow tendon for the rest of his life. As it is, he has absolutely no mark of the injury. The injury has healed completely. The legs look absolutely 100% normal. The horse has run many times since uh, the injury, and there is absolutely no trace. His value is not affected. He is as sound as a bell. In spite of having a, had a tendon injury, which would have, under, if treated with any other method, he would have had a bow for the rest of his, li his life, and maybe he would never have been sound again either. Here's Persuasive Prince winning at Bay Meadows. Third, followed by Leighton Hill. Leighton Hill is about five and a half lengths off the lead right now. Terrarium is next. And then it's Mr. Riley, who hasn't said no yet by some uh, two lengths now. Captive Glory is after that. And then it's Persuasive Prince and Erte as they begin the run halfway down the back stretch. It is Chief Eagle and Riche Danseur, and these two are setting the pace. They've opened up three lengths on Starfighter, one in third. Then comes Leighton Hill, fourth on the inside. Terrarium follows in fifth. Mr. Riley is sixth and not far out of it by uh, about a length and a half now. Then it's Captive Glory, followed by Persuasive Prince and Erte around the far turn. Chief Eagle and Riche Danseur, they continue to go stride for stride. Starfighter, one is third. Leighton Hill's under heavy encouragement, now angling four wide. Mr. Riley's fifth down on the inside now by a uh, length and a half. And Persuasive Prince is moving up in the center of the racetrack. They straighten away, and it's Chief Eagle and Chris Hummel on the lead. On the outside is Starfighter 1. Leighton Hill, Persuasive Prince now making a bold run in the center. And Mr. Riley is right there in between horses, but Persuasive Prince is coming strongly. Persuasive Prince in the center of the track gets it all over Chief Eagle. These two videos give you a graphic illustration of the effectiveness of this treatment. Uh, in no other way could these horses have been brought back to soundness, to complete soundness, the way they were with this method of treatment. Neither of the horses has any thickening of the legs, any sign of any bow, any sign whatsoever. You could spend hours looking at those legs and you, could, you would find absolutely no trace of the original injuries. Now, it is interesting to uh, record that these two horses were, were trained using the short distance interval training method which I, fi I think is so far superior to all the methods that have been used in the past. Now the next question uh, is this. How important is it to, to put an injured horse's leg, leg in ice? Does it really speed up recovery substantially? This is an interesting question. And once again, we must realize exactly what happens if, when, if you ice the horse soon enough after the injury occurs. If you can do that, the bleeding can be stopped to such an extent that it will never resume. It is interesting that a trainer in England found that if he iced all his horses after every work, as they call them here, or gallop, works in, they call them works in, in the United States, in the US, but gallops in England, which is a bit confusing. And if he uh, iced all his horses after every race, immediately after the work or gallop, and immediately after the race, he could actually sig significantly cut down on the number of leg problems that he had, sometimes by as much as 50%. This can only mean that many leg injuries are so slight initially that they would never develop into anything if the bleeding could be stopped <coughs> by simply icing the horse, horse's leg. Therefore, icing is of extreme importance. In no other way can you cause the tissues to shrink the way they do when ice is applied and the cold causes the tissues to shrink. It halts the extravasation. It halts the bleeding. It holds the swelling and so on, and if the injury is very slight, if it's slight enough, <coughs> you may cure the horse right there and then and prevent any further trouble. No matter what happens, however, it will always lessen the problem tremendously. And, uh, and, and, and so, in, in other words, after every gallop, after every work, after every 
uh, race, you should rush and put the horse's legs into ice because you're going to save yourself a lot of trouble or you may save yourself an awful lot of trouble that way. Uh, apart from that, icing the horse is of tremendous importance and if he actually breaks down and you can see the injury and so on and you really care about the horse, you should try to ice him as frequently as you can, say at least once every two hours, if possible around the clock. Now, the next question is this. Mm. Question number five. How important is the muscle stimulator, the little muscle stimulator? Does it really make a big difference or could this form of treatment be su successfully carried out without the muscle stimulator? Well, the answer is, in with very slight injuries, maybe this treatment could be carried out without the muscle stimulator. However, the muscle stimulator speeds up recovery tremendously. It, uh, if you have the muscle stimulator ready and you can use it, especially if you use it for long periods of time, like I said, if you really care about the horse, the best thing to do is to put the muscle stimulator on and leave it on around the clock. Tie the horse up. Mm, that's no big deal. A horse can stand. He doesn't have to lie down at night. Or you can even leave them, if he doesn't show signs of wanting to tear the instrument off his leg, you may even just let him loose. We have done that. And the horse doesn't even know it's there. And the muscle stimulator keeps contracting the muscle and you can leave it on all night. Hmm. Maybe set your alarm and go and see the horse, check if everything's okay every three hours at night. After all, it's worth it. If your horse is worth two or three hundred thousand dollars, getting up two or three times at, at night is no big deal. You might save yourself an awful lot of money. So, in other words, the answer to the question is that this treatment cannot be significantly carried out without the muscle stimulator. The muscle stimulator plays a Im tremendously important, essential part in the whole process and mm, can shorten the recovery period literally by 90% with any luck. It will prevent stagnation of blood, it will prevent uh, adhesions, it will prevent the uh, swelling from hardening, it will maintain normal circul circulation, it will bring fresh blood to the injured part and speed up healing tremendously once again. Now, the next question is, uh, oh yes, I should add that once again that you must realize once again the, one of the most important things that you must understand about this whole procedure is that the damage due to poor circulation is far, far, far more important than the original, original injury. Uh, therefore, by using the muscle stimulator, you are preventing that damage. You are, you are preventing the most important single factor which would bring about a recurrence of the injury. Now, when, now here a patient says like this, when I injured my Achilles tendon, this was a man speaking, uh, playing in a football game, my doctor put a cast on my leg. He said it was important to totally immobilize my leg or it would not be able to heal properly again. How can you recommend, how can you recommend exercise? Exercise will surely cause the injury to become worse. I think the best way to answer this question is to tell you the stories of two patients who came to me recently. One of them had suffered a similar Achilles tendon injury playing basketball four years ago. The conventional treatment was used. His leg was placed in a cast by an orthopedic surgeon and left on, I believe, for six weeks. When the cast was taken off, the leg was very stiff. The patient was given physical therapy to try and remove the swelling, but they could not remove the swelling. By then, the swelling, because of the total immobilization, the swelling had uh, hardened. And to this day, the leg is at least two or three times thicker than the other leg. The swelling is still there. It's still hard, it's still stiff, it's still discolored because of poor circulation, and so on and so forth. In other words, his leg will never, ever recover fully. 
because it was totally immobilized, which is about the worst thing you can possibly do. The second patient had a similar story. He came to me one day with the cast on his leg and he said that he had injured his Achilles tendon only a few days previously and the doctor had put this cast on him the, the day before. So as soon as I heard the story, I explained to him how bad immobilization was. We cut the cast off, we used the bustle stimulator, we used ice, just like with the horse, and massage, etc., exactly the same way as, as I was explained with the horses. Within about three days, all pain was gone. Within about a week, the swelling was also gone. Within three weeks, the leg was completely normal, and the man has had no further trouble. So now you can see the difference between putting a cast on and immobilizing the leg and treating it with exercise and every available form of, mus of blood stimulation, mm. of, of uh, circulation stimulation. Uh, so you see, the answer is that whether it, whether it concerns, whether in the case of human beings or horses or what have you, Legs, leg injuries, tendon injuries, and so on cannot heal in any other way but with exercise. Only exercise restores normal circulation, normal flexibility, and normal strength. Rest is exactly the opposite. It does nothing but harm. The next question is this, question number seven. Are you the only person to have tried this approach to leg injuries in horses, or are there others who have also tried the same method? Of course, there have been several other people. The best known was Mr. Strong, or Dr. Strong in England, many years ago. <coughs> he was the pioneer of this method. In fact, I, I first learned about this from him uh, quite accidentally. We read his advertisement in a paper and at the time, we had a very valuable horse, which was worth at least $200,000 by today's standards, he, at least that much. He was one of the best horses of, his, of the kind in England, and this horse injured the suspensory. As it turned out, he did not tear it, he bruised it, which actually may be worse. So we called the local vets in right away, and they told us that the best thing to do was totally immobilize the horse. Uh, and rest him in his stall, not even take him out of the stall for two months, at the end of which period they were going to fire the horse. And then they recommended at least one year's rest out in the pasture. Now we had accidentally, of course, that news terrified us and we were absolutely de devastated because this horse represented more or less everything we had at the time. So at that point we accidentally heard about Strong and we called him and he came from London and looked at the horse and said that he would try his method and instead of immobilizing the horse he advised vigorous exercise from the very beginning, the very same day the injury occurred. So we exercised the horse, he treated the horse with his little machine, stayed with us for a whole week in the hotel and the result was that at the, that at the end of three weeks the horse's leg was absolutely completely healed. There was absolutely no sign of any injury. And the horse went on to win five races the following season. Mm. And we never had any further trouble with the uh, leg. Uh, so later on, we bought Strong's uh, the muscle stimulator. His machine had the disadvantage of uh, being hand operated. So you could not leave it on the horse like the small muscle stimulator I showed in, the, in this video. It, uh, you had to actually sit with the horse, which was a big disadvantage. I mean, an hour, this treatment was quite some marathon. Uh, that's about all you could manage per day. You could not leave the little instrument on by itself for indefinite periods of time. That was a big handicap, a big drawback, and slowed things down a great deal. Secondly, uh, Strong did not realize the importance of vigorous exercise. He did not understand clearly since he had only just, he was the pioneer. He did not have the experience that we have now. Therefore, he did not understand that only exercise 
restores flexibility and normal strength and normal circulation to the tendon. And he did not stress enough the importance of really vigorous exercise, vigorous trotting uphill where the horse really uses himself fully in getting the horse to trot up that hill in, in a most excited and vigorous way possible. He didn't, did not understand that and as a result he had many failures initially. Now we have uh, perfected this method now and we have also introduced lunging which is very useful because it, it, it's so easy to do and that now makes the results much more predictable and failure virtually Im impossible. Now the next question is number eight. What are the main reasons for the recurrence of leg, in leg trouble, leg injuries? Well, uh, like I said I think before already, the main reason of course is that instead of mm, uh, waiting long enough and continuing treatment until your absolute people until the person is absolutely certain the horse has healed the trainer or owner gets anxious and he thinks everything's okay and he resumes training he resumes exercise when the horse's leg has not healed fully therefore the leg will re-injure of course and the re-injury is invariably far 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 worse than the original injury Therefore, a good rule to, to, to go by is to uh, give the horse at least, if you have any doubt of whatever about what you're doing, give the horse at least one month of treatment, of exercise and so on, after you, feel, after you have come to the point where you have decided that the horse's leg is absolutely completely cured. Give him one more month just to be safe. Now, the next question, question number nine is how can you recommend exercise for horses with leg injuries I have always been told that exercise will injure a tendon or ligament even further now that is a that brings up a very important point if you remember initially at the beginning of this video we said that the injured or torn ligaments do not affect the neighboring ligaments, the neighboring fibers of the ligaments and tendons. Therefore, the injury itself does not get worse. It has been the popular belief that if a horse is in exercise too much, or exercise at all for that matter, after an injury, the injury will get worse. That is not true. The tendon will cannot tear any further. Now, um, the first uh, the first uh, experience I, ha I had in this respect was many, many years ago. My father bought a, an old brood mare at the Newmarket sales auctions, horse auctions in England. She was a 14-year-old mare in foal, and after she had her foal, she somehow managed to bow a tendon in the pasture. She used to gallop around, and she bowed a tendon quite badly. She was quite lame, had a great big bow, and we did absolutely nothing about her since her since she was not important as a racehorse and was un, and it, there was no question of her returning to any kind of activity other than being a broodmare we just forgot all about it and to our surprise we found that the leg healed itself and after about two months there was absolutely no sign of the original injury from this you can see that in nature bow tendons and injuries to legs are far less important because they will heal naturally. The, the horse is not immobilized as he is in the unnatural circumstances which we create with our, with our lack of understanding of what should happen. Mm. Therefore, the main problem with leg injuries is not so much that they are so difficult to heal or to cure or there's anything special about them. The main problem is what we do with them. Firing, blistering, and all these other treatments do exactly the opposite of what, should be, what, what is necessary. They all immobilize the leg, they cause more swelling, they, cause, they interfere with the circulation, they weaken the leg, they cause more adhesions, they, cause, they allow the swelling to harden, 
so that you end up with a huge, thick, hard leg, stiff, weak, and of course the chances of a horse like that being able to race again and stand up to training are very poor. That's why horses with leg injuries can be bought for next to nothing. Okay, now let us briefly summarize what uh, everything that I have said on this video and let's um, just touch on the most important things. The, the most important reason why you have a, this method fails is because the person who is using it does not clearly understand what they are doing. The most important points are this. First of all, the damage done by the poor circulation, which is, which is a secondary effect or which is directly caused by the uh, injury itself, is the damage caused by the poor circulation. Therefore, the most important single thing that you can do, especially in the initial stages, is to try and maintain the circulation as close to normal as possible by, first of all, icing the horse's leg as many times as you can, let's say every hour, every two hours, if possible. Secondly, by keeping bandages on the horse all the time. An injured horse should not be left without bandages, not even for five minutes. Bandages should be worn in the stall, out at exercise, absolutely all the time. Now, next, you should pick the horse's leg up and stimulate the circulation with your fingers, massage it gently, gently, not too hard, with your fingers to try and prevent the adhesions, to try and prevent the swelling from becoming hard. You can do that <laughs> every hour if you want to, if you have the time. Then, next, you should cut the horse's feet down. That will significantly help to reduce swelling. Next, when the horse is ready for it, you should start trotting. Lunging is very good, it's excellent. Lunging should be uh, done twice a day. It has to be twice, done twice a day for this whole system to work. Even if you don't have time and you don't have the manpower, at least take the horse out in the afternoon for five minutes. But he should lun be lunged for at least, say, 20 or 30 minutes in the morning and preferably for at least another 20 or 30 minutes in the afternoon, the more the better. Do not start exercise too soon. If you start too soon, the exercise will actually aggravate the situation and cause, a, uh, cause your host to get worse, at least temporarily. Now, you have to remember that when you start exercise, you will always have a slight setback. As long as the setback isn't too bad, that doesn't matter. The setback is caused by the fatiguing the tendon tissues, which is, which, is, which is the result of the exercise. The exercise will fatigue the tissues, and the tissues will not receive the normal blood supply because the injury is still there. The circulation is will never return to normal 100% and except with exercise. Therefore, initially, because of the bad circulation, you will get some swelling. You will get an apparent slight setback. Now, uh, so as long as it, the setback isn't too bad, just continue trotting. And you will find that in a week or two or so, the swelling will go away and the leg will stop swelling and it will harden and return to normal. Uh, now, I guess that we should discuss something we haven't talked about so far. What do you do with horses which have already been injured? For instance, horses which have already been fired previously or have had previous injuries do exactly the same thing. Bandage them, keep them bandaged all the time, and trot them. Trotting uphill is by far the most effective. I remember a case where I arrived in Paris in France and this trainer told me that he had an old horse there which had a very, very, very good horse. A, a really fantastically good horse which had won several high-class stakes races. He was an outstanding horse but had been off the track for two years. They had fired him twice. 
his legs just would not hold. He had been fired on both front legs, of course, twice, and he had broken down on both front legs. And after two years, the vets just threw their arms up and said, there's absolutely nothing we can do about this horse. Well, anyhow, we found a good hill to trot up. We trotted the horse up that hill five times in the morning, five times in the evening, bandaged him up. Within three weeks, the horse was not only 100% sound and never had any further leg trouble, but he was also pretty fit after that, so that he actually won a race six weeks after I arrived and started working on him. And he won a race, I mean, with his head in his chest. He won easily and went on to win several other races. Mm. And so, you see, even if the horse has been injured previously, that doesn't make too much difference. Just keep at it, no matter what the horse's history, no matter how bad his legs may be, no matter how thick the swelling and so on, how thick the leg may be, how bad the swelling, the horse will always get sound in the end. If you just keep on trotting him and bandaging him and trying to improve the circulation and so on. Now, the lunging the horse is not as effective as trotting uphill, but a hill is not always available. Therefore, you have to have recourse to lunging and once again, as I said, lunging should be done twice a day and preferably for periods of half an hour at a time. In other words, half an hour of vigorous trotting in the morning and another half hour of vigorous trotting in the afternoon with good support bandages on all the time. Mm. And uh, anyhow, if you have any questions uh, about this treatment, I'd be happy to try and help you. Please call 916-966-7395. The number is once again 916-966-7395. That is my office and you're welcome to call anytime and I will do my very best to help you. And it is my ambition to try and save poor horses the suffering they have to undergo with the conventional treatments especially with, bliss, with firing or blistering to a lesser extent, which are both absolutely useless and do nothing but harm. Mm. And uh, secondly, to save people the misery and uh, expense of, of useless treatments and the aggravation of not being able to get their horses sound. So all the best, good luck and goodbye. I hope that you will try this method and that you will have lots of success.